have to tell you, you know, the, the, the incredible beauty of that concerto. It seems to push the technique of playing the cello right to the edge of impossibility. And is it as, you know, it would be wrong to say that you make it look effortless. You don't. You just make it look and sound magnificent. There's a lot of work goes into that. Is it as hard as the score looks? And is it? You know, it's funny you, you ask that because behind every, I think, great concerto or piece, there is someone behind there besides the composer that in some way helps it along. In this case, there was an Irish cellist, Victor Herbert who actually played his concerto in April of 1894. And right after that, Dvorak started writing his concerto. He was a he great did. cellist. And in fact, they were good friends. They taught together. And even as we speak now, a 100 years ago to the day, he, Dvorak was writing this piece, finishing the last movement, scoring it, in New York City. Just a century ago yeah. today. Now, Dvorak was not himself a cellist, as I understand it. How did he know uh, what could be done with the cello? I'm asking a lot of these things for my own benefit, as you may guess. Well, but uh, I know how did he know? He, you do things there that he might not have known could be done or couldn't be done. Well, he actually was a very good violist. He played yes. viola. He had friends who played. So he knew the instrument. But I think somehow this Victor Herbert actually helped it just got him inspired because yeah. afterwards apparently Brahms who was also a no mean composer yeah. and a no knower of good instrument writing said to Dvorak when he saw this score he said I didn't know the cello could do this really yeah. so it did, that it great? did reach some it yeah. did, did approach some right limits, then, and that? speaking right. of which I was wondering you know I we the last time we spoke you told me you were going to write a piece because I you were I'm working so on you're it. working on it yeah. now you know I'm here right so I'm I'll be your cellist I'm going to be I, and, I will need to lean on and I thought maybe I would actually you know give you a little bribe and an incentive you know do you like this I'm worth well, uh, my, I think this is for you oh, to, I thank with you. the New York Philharmonic on it so just as a little that's inspiration. Great. I appreciate that. That will, the piece that go will along. add some inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. I have to ask, does it help to know about a composer like Dvorak? In this case, things like that he liked train schedules and, that, and, and who he was in love with. Is that a help in performing a work of this kind of made a lot to it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. You want to be in the zone. And for me, it helps a lot. I love to know things about you know, how he uh, went out uh, did all kinds of things. He went to Iowa. He actually, to know that he loved folk songs, he encouraged uh, when he taught musicians to look in the music of their land and to find it and put it in the compositions. That helps. You think of home, hearth, campfires, the sky, love, beauty. It, to know that that's the kind of stuff that he worked with, his palette, I think that it helps the performance. That is fantastic. In, in working a concerto also with a big orchestra, now you, do you ever feel outnumbered? There, there are 10 cellos in that orchestra and oh. uh, a lot of other instruments. Do you ever feel like uh, there's a danger of not, not being heard or not being Well, on? That's, the, that's the general cellist paranoia. You always think that you can't be heard. But once you go get over that, <laughs> um, it is such a thrill to work with people who also want to do the same thing which I think, is, I may be wrong, but I felt that everybody was with the music. The uh, conductor from the last stand, you know, street players, whatever. It came up that way, believe Boy, me. I could feel everybody, and you know, you saw me looking out at Lauren Monroe, who, yeah. by the way, has 11 children. Can you believe it? And he is the first cellist of the Philharmonic, yeah. has been there for years and years. He was so into the music. Yes, yeah, so, I saw you watching. And I was inspired looking at him sure. and playing stuff with him. But that is marvelous. On the quality of the instrument, I, I want to ask you, is it better to have the very best? Does it make a difference? Uh, let me ask you this way. If you were had to perform the Dvorak Cello Concerto with a really cheap cigar box instrument, mm -hmm. could you do it? Uh, I think so. Um, but the thing is, it helps when you have great equipment. Yeah. And I don't want to say good instruments in a, in a way, in a sense, is a piece of equipment. Right. It's a great, also a great work of art, but I think you use it as something that helps you develop more colors and development, which, which is very interesting. But on a cigar box, you would try and find the colors anyway. 
Right. So but there's something there be beyond the instrument itself. There's oh, something sure. beyond the, you know, it's, it's the, the colors, the ideas, the thoughts, yeah. the feelings that you want to try to get to. I often wonder if someone were starting out, or say you had a child or a grandchild that you felt had a shot at being a great cellist, mm -hmm. should you try to equip him with the finest instrument you could get at that time, or would you wait until he was a little way along the line before you uh, <laughs> geared well, him up? That's a very good question. I think there are, um, music has to do with beauty. Yeah. and. It doesn't mean you have to have the finest to have something that's beautiful, you know? I think you can have an instrument that may be not so costly, but if it's well made, if it sounds good, a kid who is naturally um, wants to hear sure. good sound will want to be drawn to that instrument. I can see how that would be. If you got down so far that the instrument wouldn't hold tune or something, that kind of frustration would be uh, a wet blanket. That would not be so good. That would not be good. No. Right. That's, very, that's very interesting. Very good. Do you ever think, do different cellos lend themselves to different compositions? So you might switch from one cello to another because of what you're playing? Or? Sure. Actually, yeah. I think um, sometimes um, this cello, the Montagnana, is, I think, a baritone instrument. It has a deep, earthy yeah. voice. The Strad that I play sometimes has a tenor sound, which is incredibly refined and cultured. This. I love to play concertos with because you can really, you feel you can get, this instrument can draw the sound from the earth, you know, really from the That's stage, amazing. the bass sound really kind of, it, it, it gets to you. So they have that different character even though the range of the, both instruments would be it's the, the same. same. Right. That's right. It's like a tenor, you have such a gorgeous voice. Are you a tenor or a baritone? Well, when I sang, I sang baritone. You sang baritone. Yeah. You feel that. You know, yeah. a tenor would have the same, yeah. a different quality, but it would, you know, be, could be just as beautiful. With a lot of overlap of, That's uh, right. of range. That's right. That, that is true. What, uh, in composers like this, when you, you bring so much uh, to it, I have the feeling, the feeling I get is that the composer, Dvorak, would have liked very much what we heard tonight. Well, thank goodness he's not here to criticize it. No, he isn't, no, but I, I really... Suppose he hated it. <laughs> so what would you do? Unlikely. <laughs> unlikely. Yo-Yo, thank you for this. It will be an inspiration. Well, and, I hope uh, so. and, and I always enjoy talking with you, as usual. We have, we have more now to go with in, in connection with the cello. These, and I want to tell you that these fine instruments are, are among our finest antiques, and they're very seriously taken care of and uh, cared for. I have some insight now to show you in the care and feeding of this old cello. Watch. This cello, this Stradivarius, which I play on, I'm very lucky to play on it, I don't own. And the reason is, it's too expensive. It would be difficult, I believe, to get uh, six million for a cello. But I think we could get five. In fact, some people uh, have bought it and are letting me use it for as long as I would like. This particular instrument is in the way in the three million bracket. Strads have always been slightly more expensive than players can afford. This one is 1714. I will show you a Guarnerius del Jesu, which is way over four million dollars today. Just the craftsmanship was so beautiful that it had a very high value from the very, very beginning. What is special about an instrument like the cello is that it's made out of living material. You know, you see you know, the grain of the wood, spruce and maple, okay? The grain of the wood here goes, so all instruments are made this way. This instrument is over 260 years old, 280 years old, I can't count, but, um, and it's under a lot of pressure. Much more highly strung than a tennis racket. In fact, what makes the instrument speak, you know, I put my bow across the string, this is under a lot of pressure. I'm not using much pressure, but it releases pressure. It makes this string vibrating 
goes into here, goes to the, there's a little piece of wood that goes down there, that makes the back resonate, that uh, mixes it up in the box, and it comes through, through the F holes. Virgil receives a cello as a gift. He had no conception of the instrument. He was blowing into it. And although he does not achieve greatness on the instrument, he is soon good enough to play in a local band. A jungle, however, is no place for a cellist. And Virgil soon learns the facts of life. There's a whole uh, uh, profession involved in repairing and restoring the old instruments. It's quite different, really, uh, than building a new instrument. These instruments are worth millions of dollars. And some of the repairs take many, many years to uh, do properly. Uh, I'd be scared to death, to death to take apart an old uh, Stradivarius. We could. Uh... If you want, you could do that. Rene Morel is the surgeon for instruments. How much do you trust someone to open up your instrument? If I were to do it, I'd be scared to death. Uh, you know, what do you do? Take a chisel, whatever, you just kind of... The cello was dropped, and you see here, we have a crack along the bass bar. There's no way you can repair this without taking the top off. If you have to have an operation, if you believe in your doctor, well, uh, Rene is your guy. He's an artist in the sense that he has a feel for what is right for a piece of wood. Now, let's proceed here and see what happens. This is a part which is difficult. It was overly glue. Wood has a great strength, and yet it can break like a piece of glass. This is the saddle. Now, this is the moment of truth. See, this already had some repair. Hmm? This is a sand post patch. And uh, the year is in here. This is the sound post. This is the soul of the cello. And this, it's not glue. It's only wedge with a slight forcing between this part of the back and this mark which is on the top. So if you look at it carefully, you will see that the, uh, you have a tiny bit of a hole, an indentation there. With Jean Baptiste Villon, he signed here, and you see this is five and three, 1853. There is no secret in the making. Villon could duplicate Strat to the thousands of an inch, but it never sounds like a Strat. If the violin responds to the feeling, to the heart of the human being who plays on it. This, to him, it's his love, it's his life. If it is an instrument which has only the power, but he cannot sculpt, he cannot mold, cannot phrase, then he says, oh, it's a strong violin. 
but he wants to love the dust.